Okay, good morning in this very sunny morning. Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 13th International Conference of Baltic Literary Scholars here in Riga. We are very grateful to you who were brave enough to participate in person and also welcome those who have joined us remotely. We have the privilege of holding the conference in this beautiful, symbolic, mountain-shamed building of the National Library of Latvia, which is also a place where the, where the University of Latvia's Institute of Literature, Folklore and Art is located on the fifth floor. Many thanks to the library, which is our good partner, for the very friendly offer to spend these two conference days in the glass flame that makes up the 11th floor and offers a magnificent panorama of Riga Old Town and the Daugava River. I wish to thank warmly the conference organizing committee, particularly my very good colleagues, Jan Suga, Mara Grudule, Benedikt Skalnach, Datze Bula, Zanda Gutmann from the Liepāja University, our friend Laura Laurušaita from the Institute of Lithuanian Literature, Folklore and Folklore in Vilnius, and Anneli Michalev from the Tallinn University, who have put together an engaging program. And we are honored that among us there today is Violeta Kellertas, Professor Violeta Kellertas. Uh, the wonderful thing about the Conference of Baltic Literary Scholars is the tradition to organize it biannually in every Baltic state already for four decades and always bring a fresh perspective to these discussions. A glance through the list of presentations planned for these two days reveals an amazing diversity of the key themes, disciplines and highlights the current theoretical framework. Especially interesting for me will be to hear colleagues from Estonia and Lithuania and young researchers from the all Baltic states. And speaking about young researchers, my most sincere greetings to Saulius Vasiliauskas, who, defend, who defended his PhD last week, I think, yeah, last week. And if you haven't noticed uh, yet, the Wi-Fi password here is the seventh heaven. So I wish you a heavenly good impression of a conference, and I sincerely hope you will enjoy both days of presentations, debate, networking, and social program. And thank you once more for your participation. Before I turn uh, over the opening of the conference to the director of the Institute of Lithuanian Literature and Folklore, Ausstrap Marti Schulte, I would like to read some opening remarks from uh, Anneli Michkelev, who was not able to come, but would love to. So Anneli uh, writes, I remember the fourth international conference of Baltic literary scholars in 2001. It was December uh, in Riga, and in Riga. The topic was modernity and identity in contemporary literature. I was a doctoral student in Tartu University Department of Semiotics, and it was the first year when I have joined with Under and Tuglas Literature Center. The Baltic cooperation was very important for our institute. After the first conference, there were others. Next was in Vilnius in 2003, and after that was the sixth in Tallinn. We have something in common, the Baltic memory, in December 2005. I remember how we thought the title of the conference together with Lithuanian researcher Silvestris Gaijunas. He was in Estonia and we had very good discussions, as always, when we think about our meetings or conferences, what we have done with Baltics. Benedikt Skalmach was the main leader from Latvia who had very good ideas and interest in our cultures. If I think about these projects, what we have done together, 
for example, 300 Baltic writers, then I'd like to say that we must certainly continue. That was from Anneli. Okay, and now I give floor to Ausha Martishuta. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's a wonderful day and wonderful place for this conference. And um, I think that um, our great uh, researchers from uh, various generations uh, will uh, spend two days in a um, very construct conference. And uh, I know that after two years, conference must be in Vilnius, in Lithuania. So we must think about interesting title of another conference. But um, in this time, I want to say uh, thank you for organizers for very good organizing committee work. And uh, I wish for all you very impressive and intellectual communication, good presentations, and uh, a good conference. So let's start to work. <laughs> Good morning, colleagues. Thank you very much, Mrs. Austra Martishu, Telina Tiene. Thank you very much, Eva. And I'm happy to welcome our dear colleagues, Professor Mara Grudule and Professor Benedict Kalnach, to give their keynote speech on writing the history of Latvian literature in the Soviet period. Mara, Benedict, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, and uh, good morning to, to everybody. We have uh, divided our speech that uh, I will begin, and uh, Mara will uh, deliver uh, the uh, second part. Uh, I told already yesterday evening that this conference always makes me somehow, somehow nostalgic, and uh, this is uh, even more uh, the case uh, today as we are going to speak about the work of our uh, colleagues, most of whom we knew, and uh, the case is also dealing with Soviet period that you not necessarily have only kind things to say. So I was a little bit uh, thoughtful as, as we elaborated this paper, but let me begin. Uh, in 1905, a crucial year in the history of the Eastern Baltic literal. Latvian leftist critics Janis Asseris and Willis Darmanis published a polemical treatise, What is Andriev Sniedra preaching to us? Uh, denouncing the well-known Latvian pastor and writer. They accused Sniedra of blackmailing left-wing critics who attempt to eliminate any alternative thought. And Sniedra thus comments on the future vision of the leftists. If the poet does not write according to the rules set by poetry advisors, he will be destined to starve to death. If the assessors of art councils find the painting too green, the painter will have to repaint it more lilac or violet, or he shall be put into prison for disobedience. Assers and Darmanis, who severely attacked Niedra, could not possibly imagine how terrifyingly close his vision came to the Soviet reality following the mid 20th century occupation of the Baltic countries. It is generally agreed that the most suppressive years were those between 1946 and 1953, uh, followed by a gradual release of the strict Stalinist confines. In this paper, we try to show to what extent this might or might not be true. However, there was obviously not a clearly cut road to the freedom of thought in the decades to come. During the first post-war decades, the main ideological stronghold of power structures was contemporary literature. That was strictly channeled in order to correspond to the moral principles of the self-declared self communist society. However, similar rules were also applied to the interpretation of literary history. Characteristically, the choice of authors included in the school curricula 
was restricted to those directly or indirectly displaying their loyalty to the regime or being retrospectively applicable to, for such ideological purposes. In his book, Latvian Literature under the Soviets, 1940-1975, the exile scholar Rolf Sekmanis reminds of the main principle of Soviet ideology, that of two cultures in bourgeois society, one progressive, the other reactionary. We take from each national culture only its democratic and socialist elements. We take them solely and unconditionally as a counterbalance to bourgeois culture, to the bourgeois nationalism of each nation. It was along this road that Assers and Dermanis uh, were already moving early in the century. Under the Soviet rule, such opinions acquired the status of an indisputable truth. Towards the late 1950s, the majority of the population in the Baltic countries had come to the painful consensus that the existing conditions under Soviet rule will last much longer than initially expected and started to cope with the situation, even though below the surface there was deeply seated disagreement with the regime. All principal literary scholarship publications of the Soviet era in Latvia bear signs of this contradictory situation and were forced to submit to censorship. In our discussion, we examine some of the main sources of literary history writing, such as the six-volume uh, history of Latvian literature published between 1956 and 1963, the six edited volumes of Latvian literary criticism that appeared between 1956 and 1964. The investigation of Latvian literary criticism of the second half of the 19th century by Elza Knorpe in 1962. The history of Latvian literature in Russian, two volumes in 1971. A monograph on the history of the Latvian novel by Ingrid Kishental in 1979 and the history of Latvian literature from its beginnings uh, until the uh, 1880s uh, by Arvids Grigulis Mild Vosberg on Otto Chakras, published in 1987. In all these undertakings, partially based on serious research and displaying the competent knowledge of the contributors, the scenery of Latvian literature was consciously deformed, both on a large scale, suppressing or completely omitting important authors from the literary process, and in minor details, with scholars desperately struggling to recover some ground for their interpretations. In order to trace these attempts in more detail, our two case studies focus on one of the first Latvian novels, Merne Kulaik, the Surveyor's Times, um, in 1879 by Reynis and Matis Skaldzitis, as well as on the Soviet period reception of early Latvian language texts. The official theorists of the Soviet regime promoted an extremely narrowed understanding of the concepts first established in the 19th century Marxist philosophy. The main task of a literary historian was to evaluate the ideological position of each author. The ideas expressed in literary te texts, not their aesthetic particularities, were of primary importance. Writers' submission to the ideological rules was explicitly stated as more important than the literary talent. 19th century authors who contributed to the rise of national consciousness were interpreted from the point of view of the ideology, ideology of class struggle and historical links to Baltic German literature were mostly ignored. The ties with Russian culture were put into foreground and almost all connections to other European literatures passed over in silence. The novel by Reynis and Matis Skaudzit, uh, Mernia Kulaiki, has been lucky enough to escape the fate of many other literary texts, never being fully expelled from cultural memory. Met with some reservations by the first reviewers, it was nevertheless almost immediately recognized as an important contribution to Latin letters. The novel enjoyed a public success and was printed in several new editions. To the 1913 edition, 
about 60 visual images of the uh, main characters drawn by the artist Edwards Brensons were added that contributed to the popularity of the novel. Already in 1909, a concise essay by Robert Klaustinch delving into the poetics of Manek Laike was published. Second expanded edition of this monograph appeared in 1926. In 1911, the novel was adapted for stage by Pavel's Gruznan, performed by the New Riga Theater. During the interval period, there were, among others, three productions by the modernist director Edward Smilis at Dallas Theater. One of the first major novels was again put on stage in a new version in drama format at the National Theater in 1950. In the late 1970s, the dramatist Paul Sputnich, coming from the same Pebalga region as Brothers Kaltit, created a new text adaptation. This version became a huge success in drama theater's open-air performances in the mid-1980s. In 1968, a movie based on the plot of the novel also featured many of the most popular Latvian actors. There were several factors that contributed to the official recognition of the novel. First, Menek Laike arguably embodied one of the first instances of realism in Latvian literature and its reception was thus tailored according to the idea that pre-Soviet literature was already paving the way for upcoming revolutionary transformations in society. Secondly, the authors were local school teachers from a modest social background, and this thus well suited for the ideological claims of the regime. An important detail constantly underlined in the Soviet period was that Matisse attended her Russian language rural school. Still, particularities of the reception clearly display certain trends in literary history writing to which we now turn. The first volume of Latvian literary criticism in 1956 includes a section on early reviews of the novel. Characteristically, not all of them are reprinted the article by Alexander Svebers, one of the representatives of Riga Latvian society, is omitted. Paradoxically, Webers in fact provided the most balanced evaluation of the novel, especially with regard to it as an important achievement in Latvian literature. As a representative of the Riga Latvian society and a Baltic German, he was subjected to ideological exclusion. Elsa Knote, in her History of Latvian Literary Criticism in 1962, devotes a sub-chapter to a brief evaluation of the importance of Maniac Like, where she also comments on these early reviews. Knote, in particular, stresses the close ties of Brothers Kautzite to Russian realist literature. The author's worldview is characterized as idealist and partly reactionary due to their religious beliefs and conservative social position. However, it is claimed that realist method allowed them to present a truthful picture of life, even despite their own opinions, a possibility that had been rightly pointed to by the classics of Marxism-Leninism. This statement by Knope um, is made with a, uh, with a reference to Janis Niedre, an orthodox Soviet Latvian literary critic, uh, who in his Latvish literature was to republish 10 years earlier, in 1952, used the word aims, nuodomi, instead of opinions, uskate, explicitly pointing towards serious limitations of Kaltzita's approach. Knope, to an extent, minimizes the ideological threat potentially caused by the novel. The word, uh, the word rightly or correctly, pareisi, remains one of the most often employed in Knope's book as it as if it, it would provide a secure haven for her thoughts, giving them the strength of collective authority. Her topping being 19th century literary criticism, she mentions all early reviews of the novel, including Weber's, and thus makes a step toward reinstating a more reliable overall picture. An interesting case is provided by Harald, the poet Vensko Ed Edwards, who in his review, deals with both Latin novels published the same year. Discussing the other text, Satsivis Vilni by Mater Juris, uh, alongside Kaltzita's effort. Uh, later, during the uh, Soviet period, Matas's novel is constantly pushed out of the literary reception. 
and the early reviewer, uh, Ben Squidward's writing in 1879, is thus, in the eyes of Knut and many others, a right to condemn his novel, while also denouncing the influence of German popular literature, especially novels by Eugenie Marlitt. However, Knopf does not re accept reviewers' remarks with regard to the good understanding of the novel genre by Martyrs, and states instead that the reactionary ideological stance of the author makes it virtually impossible for him to create realistic characters. In passing, Knopf also criticizes Kaudzites for their use of some elements of popular literature that adds picaresque features to Mernik Loic. The exclusion of Weber's criticism from the above anthology and the direct juxtaposition of the first two Latvian novels on aesthetic and ideological grounds clearly point toward the principle of two cultures in one national culture. Overall, the major flow of socialist and leftist ideology and literary criticism was that artistic phenomena were principally explained mainly through the prism of class struggle. One of the most contradictory cases in Latvian literary history writing is provided by the sixth volume history of Latvian literature, 1956 to 1963, supervised by Ewald Sokols, director of the Institute of Language and Literature of the Academy and Sciences between 1951 and 1963. Conceived in an attempt to overthrow the narrative of literary history published in the 1930s, this official Soviet history of Latvian literature divided authors according to their political sympathies. The analysis of Maniac Loike was for this publication written by literary scholar Ingrida Kirschenthal. It is interesting to follow how her opinions first appear here and are then modified during the 1970s. We take a closer look at three publications, the articles in Latvian Literary History, uh, the second volume published in 1963, in the Russian language version of Latvian Literary History in 1971, and in her history of the Latvian novel in 1979. Writing in 1963, Kishentale puts emphasis on the strong impact on Russian culture in the build-up of the author's personalities and comments, among other aspects, on the formative role of the productions of Gogol's The Inspector General and Ostrovsky's plays in Vatsbyrbalg, mentions early translations from the Russian language made by Matisse, and even involves ideologically charged context of the people of the future in the Latvian countryside as well as speaks about the common sense of the masses. Other details important for her are the conscious turn to realism in the novel, despite the author's close ties to the Hanhuterian religious community. This means that despite their controversial relation to the religion, Kaudzites are in the progressive camp, able to trace the ideological conflict between feudalism and capitalism. At the same time, however, Kishental strongly denounces the author's inability to provide a positive ideal. Thus, she remains rather orthodox in comparison to the more nuanced version provided by Knope at almost the same time. According to Kishental, Pratnix, one of the main characters of the novel, displays typical features of the new type of capitalist who exploits other people. Novels linked to popular literature is denounced. It is stated that most reviewers, contrary to Robert Klaustin's opinion in the 1920s, rightly consider the overall quality of literary text being diminished by the picaresque aspects of the novel. Uh, the 1971 edition of the Russian language history of Latvian literature does not mention whether the contributions had been translated into Russian or did the authors prepare them themselves? Anyway, the overall impression is that of considerable simplification. Kishenthal maintains that the only books in Kaudzites' childhood home were religious. Even if already in 1963, she had discussed collective reading of popular sentimental stories taking place there. The authors of the novel thus undertake a conscious effort to make themselves free from the ties of the religious worldview. The characteristic of Pratniks uh, here 
clearly reminds of Soviet ideological constructions of wealthy uh, peasants. Obraz Kulaka. The speech of character Pietux, an ironically represented figure of the National Awakening period, is called useless, the Smithsonian rich. However, the philosopher uh, Vilnius Zarinch later convincingly demonstrated that the poem this recite, uh, recited by Pietux on a festive occasion should rather be called eclectic as it contains seeds of various cultural traditions which he attempts to understand but has not been able fully to grasp. The characteristics given by Kishenthal are unfortunately close to street language. Uh, most of them go under the label untranslatable, I would say. Uh, and not conceived in terms of literary history. Uh, thus, Pietux is um, characterized as pridurkavati uchitil and duhovna uh, ubožstveni pustamelja, while Schwalkst, who in, his no in the novel tries to mimic Baltic German everyday habits, is vyskačka, uh, hvastun, pustazvon, and shut. Uh, the background of Kirschenthal's 1979 history of the Latin novel is more theoretical. There she introduces the concept of panorama novel, involves a comparison to Cervantes's Don Quixote. Theoretical contexts become broader and apart from the traditional Soviet period references to the 19th century Russian critic Belinsky, German theorists Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, Friedrich Schlegel, Friedrich Spielhagen, are involved, while theoretical approaches of Mikhail Bakhtin are contextualized as well, with a special emphasis on the novel as the art of the present. However, this is not a straightforward development of a more nuanced approach. While some of the characteristics paradoxically become even more ideologically charged, this is most clearly visible with regard to the character of the somewhat naive peasant Kensis. He is described as silly, superstitious, talkative, and funky. It is interesting to juxtapose these characteristics to the ones given to Kensis by another expert of Kautzeit's novel, Otto Chakras, who speaks of him as a somewhat rude person, while at the same time being full of initiative and self-confidence. Parupish is Dariks, Pashab Zeniks, Zemnex. This last quote refers to the 1987 edition of literary history, but some of the main points of Chakras' research had already been developed in his articles published in the late 1950s. In 1964, Chakras defended his thesis on the topic of Mernia Kulaiki as the first realist novel in Latin literature. Arthur Uzos, in his review, review of the thesis, recognizes the quality of research, pointing toward the careful study of language used in the novel, while, characteristically, he also puts Chakras' approach in the context of Soviet literary debates. In 1968, Chakras' monograph on the same title, of the same title is published. Contrary to literary histories published at the time, the author is astonishingly confident in his judgments and concentrates on specific poetic details. He pays tribute to the artistic complexity of the main characters and unmasks some of the traditional aspects of the novel reception, such as the criticism of wealthy peasants. In 1980, Chakras supplied careful and detailed comments to a new edition of Mernia Kulaik. This publication is one among others during this period that show researchers delving carefully into details of literary texts. In the portrayal of peasants in Kautzeit's novel, Chakras sees contradictory characters with many sympathetic features. And these uh, characteristics are maintained in the literary history published in 1987. In two years time, in 1989, Literary scholar and prose writer Janis Kalminch, in his Kalna Kaivani life novel of Brothers Kaudzit, added the authors of Mernia Kulaiki to the gallery of principal contributors to Latin literature and culture, alongside others to whom he had already devoted some of his careful biographic studies. In a way, this lengthy book by Kalminch summarizes intellectual efforts constantly taking place in the research community. 
even if beneath the surface and despite the unfavorable conditions of the decades of Soviet rule. But on the other hand, we should not ignore the fact that Kalmich, in his capacity of the director of the Institute of Language and Literature in the 1970s, was also the main editor of the above of Russian language history of Latvian literature. Unfortunately, and highly regrettably, not everybody in the generations of scholars working at the time, and not on all occasions, found an opportunity and courage to express his or her true sentiments and opinions. Good morning. So, I'll speak about the reception of early Latvian texts in Soviet Latvia and in exile. The ideological doctrines adopted in Soviet Latvia had a major impact on literary history writing. For the immediate aftermath of the war, they prescribed an almost complete omission of comparative approach to literary phenomena and determined an extremely selected choice of authors allowed to be included in literary history. This had a severe consequences, especially because the creators of early Latvian literature had been Baltic Germans. Many 19th and 20th century Latvian writers could also not be linked to the proletarian or so-called progressive literature and were omitted from our views of Latvian literature. Under the sway of the communist ideology, Latvian culture for decades lost almost all connections to Western European traditions and an awareness of the inner logic of aesthetic transformations in literature as an art form. A different situation was in exile, where despite an enormous lack of sources, there were serious efforts in preserving cultural memory. The reception of the Bible translation was among important factors in the identity construction of Latvian exiles. The decade of the 1970s can be signaled out here for two interconnected reasons. First, the two roots of Latvian culture, folklore and the translation of the Bible in the context of a productive interplay between national tradition and European culture were emphasized once again. In 1974, a facsimile of the first edition of the Bible in 1694 was published. It was accompanied by the studies of the personality of the first translator and Strick, as well as a monograph of the translation of the Bible by the exile historian Ernest Dunstadz. The facsimile publication of a manuscript by Glück's contemporary Janis Reiters demonstrates how an extensive use of European libraries and archives opened up new opportunities in gathering source material for the studies of Latvian literary history. In Soviet Latvia, the situation was different. In his History of Latvian Literature, published in 1952, Janis Niedre locates the starting point of self-conscious Latvian literature only in the middle of the 19th century and almost completely disregards the value of early written texts in Latvian. Looking at literature from the perspective of class struggle and emphasizing Baltic Germans as oppressors, Niedre states, I quote, the German pastors in Latvian in Latvia even did not try to understand the Latvians and their language properly, and therefore their efforts are not in any way comparable to the creative achievements of the people, the end of the quotation. The first Latvian books are, according to him, extremely unsatisfactory in their use of the Latvian language. In the figure of Gotthard Friedrich Stender, one of the most important figures of the Enlightenment, Niedre sees a defense of the interests of German upper class, I quote, against the rebellious Latvian peasant population. Earlier literary histories, according to Niedre, I quote, shamefully make Latvian poetry, prose, drama, and criticism 
a disciple of the literary tradition established by the oppressors and enemies of the people. The end of the quotation. Similar ideology prevails in the collection of Latvian literary criticism, Latvian literature's critica, compiled and edited by Arvids Grigulis and Willis Austroms. With regard to the inclusion and exclusion of particular authors and texts, in close, it closely follows the ideologi ideologically prescribed strategy. The edition begins with a text from the latter half of the 19th century, while only then, I quote, literary criticism becomes an active weapon of social struggle. Baltic German pastors created literature which was hostile to the Latvians and provided primitive and cynical examples of literary criticism. These trends had a reactionary and impending role in the development of Latvian culture. The end of the quotation. All the publications prepared by Baltic Germans are strongly condemned. The 1960s, however, already marked by several important discoveries that helped to broaden the context of Latvian literary history. A document providing the existence of the first book in Latvian printed in Germany in 1595 allowed to link the beginnings of Latvian letters to the Reformation in Europe. In 1965, it was also proved that the first theater performance in Latvian took place as early as 1818, half a century before the official beginnings of the Latvian theater in Riga in 1868. On this earlier occasion, the Latvian peasants performed the German drama Friedrich Schiller's tragedy, Die Räuber, the, Ro the Rubbers. Links to German culture became obvious once again. The History of Latvian Theatre by Carlos Kunzinsch, published in 1968, also included a brief discussion of the history of German theatre in Latvia. These ties to Western European culture were thus carefully reinstated alongside Russian influences. Some of the main discoveries were made by the bibliographer and cultural historian Alexei Sapins. His investigations clearly point to the role of an individual researcher in the evaluation of literary history. Apin's investigations reveal the fundamental importance of archive studies that even in the given circumstances could provide some clues for the readers and thus at least implicitly counter some of the sweeping generalizations often used in the ideological rhetoric of the regime. Still, working under the conditions of Soviet censorship, Apinis managed to publish a history of the book printing and distribution in Latvia, in which about two-thirds of the text is devoted to the contribution of Baltic Germans from the 16th to mid-19th century. The discoveries made by Apinis were subsequently incorporated into literary history co-authored by Otto Chakars, Arvids Griguls and Milda Losberga in 1987. The impact of German literary culture was to a certain extent acknowledged and early Latvian texts put in the historical context being discussed alongside the importance of Latvian folklore. This re-evaluation was even extended to an inclusion of religious texts into literary history. The 1980s and 1990s continued with bringing two separate discourses of literary scholarship in exile and in Latvia closer together. One example is the scholarly interest in the personality of Ant Gluck who became the subject of study of Constantine Skarulis in Latvia and of several Latvian scholars in Germany and even Russia. Historians and literary scholars from Russia, Sweden, Latvia and Germany doing research on Gluck and his contribution in education, linguistics, literary, literature and theology met for the first time to his 300th anniversary in Halle in Germany in 2004. In the last three decades, several books on Glück and his creative work have been published in Russia and in Germany. In this paper, and conclusion, in this paper, 
we followed the setbacks that Latvian literary criticism of the Soviet period had to experience while also pointing towards such gradual improvements as more nuanced interest in cultural history, the importance of careful analysis of literary text, as well as the gradually diminishing level of ideological rhetoric. Only during the post-Soviet era, however, it was possible to bring together an interest toward cultural history and the methodology of European humanities. From 1990s, publications in literary monthly catalogs paid attention to new methods of literary scholarship and books on literary theory followed. Viktor Sivbulis published fragments of translation of some literary theorists from the West supplied by his own comments and evaluation of different approaches. An important re-evaluation of Latvian literature was provided by Guntis Beralis in his 1999 monograph, Latvian Literature. The international context of Latvian literature had also been strengthened by new translations into other languages. Importantly, among these translations is also a German language version of Merniak Laiki by Waldus Bissenieks, one of the most instrumental figures in promoting the close ties of Latvian and German literature. Clearly, a discussion of 21st century literary criticism in Latvia is beyond the scope of the present paper. We just want to point to the possibilities opened up to scholars in the humanities, especially important for those who themselves had experienced the ideological pressure of the Soviet rule. Therefore, we round up our talk with another opinion expressed in the early 20th century by literary critic Janis Assers, writing about the German dramatist Friedrich Hebel in the context of 19th century literature, Assers denounced the movement of young Germany, Junges Deutschland, for putting the importance of political views of the authors above their ability in art. Unfortunately, it was the slippery path that Assers himself undertook some years later. Much more dramatically, similar views became the basis of an official state ideology during the Soviet era, stretching over several decades of so-called proletarian dictatorship that significantly changed the cultural scenery in Latvia. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. I'm happy to open a discussion at this moment. So please, if you have any questions, you can come here to the microphone or, or raise your question from your seat. Any remarks from our Lithuanian colleagues, maybe? Eva? Thank, thanks, both of you, for your lecture. I know that your research is part of a fundamental project, which is still ongoing. Would you like to comment briefly on this project? I think it includes also maybe Estonian, Lithuanian literature or not? Thank, thank you for this question. We uh, have a project with the uh, coordinated um, at the University of, of Turku. It is about literary history writing, but there are only some uh, some countries. It's Finland, it's Czech Republic, it's Russia. That is interesting. And uh, it's Latvia. So the idea is of moving uh, from very orthodox part of the world, uh, like Russia is even in 21st century, uh, then to, to Latvia that has been influenced quite a lot 
then to Czech Republic that was part of the Soviet bloc, and then Finland that was kind of affiliated uh, to uh, to also this Soviet influence sphere, uh, but not not uh, that much under pressure. So the focus is on uh, Soviet and also uh, also on on, on post uh, Soviet uh, Soviet period, and we are. Mm, still in the process of uh, thinking and e evaluating what exactly literary writing literary history uh, meant um, during the Soviet period. Um, perhaps you noticed that in our paper we mm, stopped somewhat short of uh, saying that probably was the case that literary histories uh, were censored more uh, than other types of, of publications, like like monographs, like uh, editions of particular texts. That that is an important part of the of the cultural scenery. But uh, uh, of course, it it needs uh, really very detailed in investigations, which we are um, uh, trying to do. And and um, I know that in this conference we also have a, a paper on the, uh, coming by by Alshayergutian on Lithuanian uh, Soviet literary history. So we will also see how it how it works together. So, th thank you for your interesting paper. And um, if I am right, uh, uh, you have a main idea to to see how ideologically was uh, how ide ideological impact was on literary and in literary subject, more this ideological influence. Yes, you are researching your work. Yes. So it is, uh, but it is of course as you already said, is, uh, and I think uh, in my paper I will try to do the same. Um, this influence, influence are very complicated. Of course, uh, the most canonic and strict was literary histories, but later uh, there are uh, uh, much more sl 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 slice, or how to say, Zopic uh, language and other, other moments who mixed this Soviet and anti-Soviet ideology. And this mix, I think, is one of the interesting to research, this mix. Thank you for your paper. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question and thank you for the remark. According to the early period of uh, investigations of the early period of uh, Latvian literary uh, history, that's, uh, that's a complicated uh, case because uh, the investigations were going on, as I have already said, and there were also important investigations in exile, not to be are not to be ignored at all. And so the literary scholars in Soviet Latvia have had to combine their knowledge about the uh, novelties in the um, investigations of literary history with the ideology. I'm happy to say that in the 80s, uh, at the end of the 80s, the situation more or less changed and this uh, literary history of 1987 was really a very good book and the students are using it still. Uh, a little bit of some ideological ideas uh, in the, at the very beginning, but more or less uh, the uh, facts and uh, also the comments uh, on the early texts are uh, uh, in their place. Thank you. I'll add just briefly the uh, the project uh, we are speaking about is called the politics of, of literary history uh, writing. So it's really about this ideological pressure. Um, on the other hand, in on a lot of occasions when you go into details, you see that it was also a matter of choice. And for example, if you if you remember these characteristics given by Kirschenthal, a very very 
very solid, I would say, scholar. Um, in 1971, in this Russian language edition, kind of really saying that these are very, uh, very, very simple uh, people. Uh, it, the context is, let's say, at least the film of 1968, where all these characters, people know all these characters, and literary history says they are rather stupid and not not complex characters as people knew them. So it's 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 really a very complex uh, issue, and these individual choices are are always uh, always there. And in uh, if I may add just one more detail with this Russian language edition, I was thinking also about our, our contemporary situations as 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 Lithuanians or Estonians or and Latvians. Uh, we think about our topics, and then we we have this Russian language text. But we are doing more more or less the same thing. We are speaking or, or writing English or getting our text translated, and are we, are we sure that our real meanings, what we mean, uh, are they kind of really put into, into words in, in another language? So it's constantly a problem in, in our research, even, even today. Thank you very much. Any more questions or remarks? If not, then thank you. We can head directly into our first coffee break then. <laughs> Now we have two hours for the next uh, session. I am also in, in the position of authority. <laughs> But basically, we have uh, we have half an hour for each paper, uh, including discussion. Now, I would suggest that we try to to keep it at about 20, 23 minutes, maybe, so we have time for for discussion. And uh, we, I think, we ask questions after each paper. So, Osha Yurgutina, Lithuanian Institute of Lithuanian Literature and Folklore, please, Osha. So perhaps I, and of course I prolong uh, the themes and uh, programs of the first uh, uh, paper. Oh, uh, okay, <laughs> thank you. So I will. Uh-huh, uh -huh. okay, thank you. Uh -huh. So perhaps I, prolong uh, the ideas and problems of a first paper uh, presented by Mara and Benedict. And perhaps I will add something, something new or something for discussions. So my paper, yeah, oh. the call to war in the history of literature. Uh, the national literary histories that flourished in the 19th and 20th centuries contributed actively to the integration of na national society and construction of social reality. During the Cold War, 1946-1991, the world was divided into two opposing military blocs, the capitalist West and the socialist East. In the book, History of Literary Cultures of East Central Europe, Junctures and Disjunctures in the 19th and 20th centuries, John Neibauer took a new perspective on European national literature histories. He highlighted their multicultural complications and in addition to positive effects, stressed the negative, isolating features of national history, which fostered hostility towards, na towards national minorities and neighbors. Uh, the quotation, oh, sorry. Uh, the quotation from his article. Uh, the national self-images of the last two centuries must be revised today not only because of globalization and European integration, but above all because they continue to fo fo ferment aliation 
hostility and aggression against minorities and against, and against neighboring states. The, the end of quotation. His suggestion to rethink uh, national history encouraged me to take a look at the new processes of integration and disintegration unfolding in those histories during the Cold War. It is obvious that the literary history of the occupied Lithuanian nation lost its purpose of the uniting all its citizens and the whole Lithuanian culture, splitting into two separate blocks, the communist East and the emigre bourgeois West, and according into the two opposing literature branches, socialist realism and decadence or modernism. As was said in the first paper, uh, according to Marx's notion, there are two cultures and one culture it's about the, the, this idea. This internal social and aesthetic confrontation is the best illustrated by four volumes, the four, the four volume academic history of Lithuanian literature edited by Kostas Korsakas. It covers literature from earliest writing, the 14th century annals of Lithuania, to the latest literary publications in 1967. It was written and published between 1957 and 1968 and, and composed the periods of both, Khrushchev Thor and Brezhnev stagnation. Ten years later, Uh, ten years later, uh, a typical stagnant and somewhat concise history of Lithuanian literature in two volumes, edited by Jonas Langutis, was published between 1979 and 1982. The ideological and methodological structure of its narrative remained the same as that of a history edited by Korsakas. This history clearly shows that during the Cold War, there was no fundamental break in the historiography of the literature of the fall and stagnation period. Both were written collectively and uh, uh, written according to the same principle of loyalty to the Communist Party. The other's literature, that is the latest, the best works of emigre writers and poets, was not included in either of these literary histories. The biggest difference between them was the rhetoric of literary interpretation, which softened into ambiguous phrases, both praising the artistry of the classical works of, and criticizing it for its ideological limitations which uh, Alexei Yurchak attributed to the mimetic resistance. The boundaries between socialist realism and modern literature also blend as the later became increasingly widespread in Soviet Lithuanian culture. Dominated by author-centered positivistic and vulgar Marxism, the methodology of historical research made more room for the text-orientated literary descriptions, which converge with Russian formalism as objective literary science. After more than half the uh, after more than half the writers had left occupied Lithuania for United States, the imperative of writing a parallel history of literature was obvious. Since they did not have the conditions and good conditions and the necessary archives to write larger works in literary history, they closed a different and much more successful path to write partial history of emigre literature, which was a different and um, uh, which was taboo in Soviet Lithuania. That was how Lithuania uh, 
literature abroad was uh, edited by Kaziz Bradunas, was published in uh, 1968, and the other book, uh, The History Literature of the Lithuanian Exodus, uh, edited by Bradunas and Shilbauris, was published in 1992. Although the dominant ideological attitudes to the Soviet literary history, the critical and separate emigre histories were written, they did not barricade themselves in anti-communism and in the war against the Red Lithuania, but discussed and created an overall projection of national literature. In his article, a Comprehensive look at the literature of our exodus, Jozef Gernius formulated the most important perspective for the future of Lithuanian literature, cherished by numerous emigrants in the future. In the future, the fragmented parts of Lithuanian literature will have to be brought together into unified national literature, because a common tradition, a common language, and a common Lithuanian reality ensure their internal link. And I want to present the quotation from this article. Lithuanian literature was split into the currents of the uh, enslaved land and the free world. Because of entirely different circumstances, they both developed at different directions. But equally, integrally, they both belong to our nation and ultimately form a single whole, even though there is a deep internal tension within this whole. Yet, basically, both at home and abroad, who are not they and we, but the same we, the children of the same nation, feast by centuries. The end of quotation. This was also the idea of second uh, literature of the Lithuanian Exodus, which was started to write in 1983, and published at the beginning of independence in 1992 as a supplementary third volume to Soviet literary history edited by Lankutis. The quotation from this history. Uh, the work is now appears is the third volume of the two volume history of Lithuanian literature published in Vilnius. However, is uh, However, the structural plans of both volumes have not been followed here. The aim was to make the work not monophonic, but poly polyphonic, not boring and diverse and insights and in conclusions, in its insights and conclusions. Let this book not be pretension parting of the way, but just doing what could not be done in Lithuania for a, for a long time, bearing in mind, above all, that just as there is only one Lithuanian language, so is there only one Lithuanian literature. Uh, criticizing the census, uh, censored and disciplined interpretation of writers in Soviet literary history, the diaspora openly expressed the goal of integrating national literature, which could not be made public in Soviet historiography. Um, and the hist histories of emigre literature were written in a similar spirit to the one that prevailed in the Santa Shvesa organization, founded in the United States about 1960s, it set the task for the Lithuanian diaspora to turn its face towards Lithuanian. Also, it was impossible to publicly express such national integrative expectation under the conditions of occupation and totalitarianism. Soviet writers and scholars secretly read and circulated the works of the diaspora of their trust friends. They took a secret interest 
in its criticism and its literary journals, finding a lot of what was close to their hearts and minds. In discussing Nabowa's critique to the closed nature of history of national literature, the opposite must be said. Due to the geopolitical impact of the Cold War, it was separated into two very different narratives and became alienated from itself. Integrated national literary history, as we see from examples, uh, um, existed only in vision as a future projection. Opposing geopolitical forces also had a strong impact on also, on also that comparative historical research and in comparative literary studies. As opposed to the diaspora, a yet unsaid confrontation of Eastern and Western orientations emerged in Soviet comparative literary history and in history, literary history. Prim primitive studies of Russian literary influences on lit Lithuanian literary prevailed. Kostas Korsakas, director of the Institute of Lithuanian Language and Literature, was the most active propagandist of such ideological comparative studies. In his books, The Friendship of Literatures and Literary Contacts, he demonstrated to all literary scholars how the new newly matched innovative direction in Lithuanian literature, the ph phenomenon of Soviet literary friendship should be researched by subordinating it to central Russian literature and literary studies and to the idea of building of communism. After the collapse of USSR, Vitautas Kubilius voiced his negative view on this tradition. Uh, yes. So the quotation from his article, comparative studies were dominated by research of impact of Russian literature in order to demonstrate loyalty and gratitude to the Congress. Soviet culture resulting from the concept of Slavophilism and Bolshevik Marxism was aggressively performing the colonization function on the vast territory of Central East Europe. However, they did not manage to disperse the autochthonial culture of these nations, nor to kill the national language. The end of quotation. But this generalization is not entirely correct. We should also see another moment in Soviet educational system. Foreign literature divided into two histories of Western and Russian literature as the history of the most famous later literary classics, occupied very significant place in it. The contacts of Lithuanian literature with and between Western and Eastern literatures often became ideologically ambiguous by mixing Soviet and world literature in one whole. And I would like to show one quotation from uh, uh, history of Lithuanian literature, where this mix is very clear to, to, we can see. On one hand, we can read, Lithuanian literature developed not as isolating and separate phenomenon, but as a part of a whole multina multinational Soviet literature, subordinated to its common laws, which were determined by the same socialist order of life, the Marxist ideology and the communist parties, and divided line of cultural policy. But on the other hand, during this period, Lithuanian literature was particularly active in trying to perceive itself in the context of world culture, to learn on it and to establish itself in it. So world culture and Soviet tradition is in one episode mixed 
and in, yes. During the stagnation, were written two of the most important books in comparative, comparative studies, Vitautas Kubilius' uh, Lithuanian Literature and Process of World Literature and Donato Sauka's book, The Epilogue of the Age of Faust. The, the second book was written during the stagnation period and was um, a material in his lectures and seminars at Vilnius University, but it was published very late in 1998. So these two books. Uh, and what is uh, the most important, that the most important goals of these books was geopolitical. Both scholars directed studies into the history of Lithuanian literature away from its from the ideological theme of the friendship between Soviet peoples toward the history of the Western literature. Uh, both authors sought to stop the contempt for the West that had been ideologically instilled in several, several generations and to show that Lithuanians were normal like other peoples whose literature belonged to the field of classical European culture. I came to conclusion about the paradox of the Cold War in the history of literature. It exists, and at the same time, did not exist. Now we, we can confirm the great merit of the histories of emigre literature, because they were written not only as a confrontation, but also as compensation and complementation to solve the history of national literature. In the field of the national literature, the incite, incitement class struggle was much more uh, stronger in the Soviet literary histories, which were influenced by totalitarianism and censorship. However, the scholar from the Soviet bloc, Kubilius, wrote 20th century literature after they reestablished the country independence. For the first time, two opposing narratives of Lithuanian literature divided by the Cold War met in his book, which is testament to the secretly cherished integrated history of national literature. The volumes of the literary history written on both sides of the Iron Curtain form a paradoxical integrated picture of national literature, which still awaits a greater debate and more analytical assessments. Thank you for attention. Yes, it, it was the main idea to mention, to include uh, emigre writers and later to make negative commentary. <laughs> yes. But uh, uh, everybody knows that it is the play, ideological play. Everybody understands this play. So, 
sooner they would be first to say that there is an evil and internet. Uh, yes. It's a national internet. Yes. What was the response of the Chilean kind? Uh, I think that, uh, yes, as I said, that immigrate scholars can to say publicly, officially this, to write this uh, idea of integrate national history or national literature. Uh, and, uh, of, and in Soviet Lithuanian, you can write so uh, with, expect uh, with, with future plans. But of course, of course, ev everybody who uh, was interested in literature and literature history, of course, think about this, this history and this literature as a native and integ integrating thing. So secretly, as I said, in, 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 in secretly they hope and they think about it. And for me, it was uh, a nice example of Kobilu's book that he wrote, 20th century literature, yes, because this book uh, had a lot of critique, uh, critique, a lot of critique and commentaries were mostly critique. Yes, but I think that yeah, it is a first step to think and to write. I, I think that it has came a time, I think so, to write 20th century Lithuanian his, literary history, yes. We are afraid it to do uh, a lot of time because we are afraid to make a big narrative to write a big narrative, national or other, other kind of big narrative. But I, now, I think that now we have some new methodological perspectives and yes, and we have a lot of material good and perhaps we have, we have material to do it, job. Yes. So, the present paper is an excerpt from a broader overview about the mutations of the socialist realist doctrine in Soviet Latvia, prepared for the upcoming sixth volume of the art history of Latvia. The idea of socialist realism as an open concept can be found in the local press as early as 1941, when artist and critic Artus Jurstetas, quoting the Soviet cultural official Vyacheslav Skvarikov's praises of artistic mastery and perfect forms needed to express high ideas, concluded that various creative credos will coexist under the banner of socialist realism, and this official art would not level artists' individualities. This, however, turned out just wishful thinking, considering the darkest Stalinist period with its campaigns against formalism ahead. At the same time, it is tempting to invoke Estonian literary scholar Jan Undusk's thesis that socialist realism was not defined in terms of either motives or stylistic choices. He stated that the party kitsch was not invented by party ideologues, but by artists themselves, looking for secure work conditions and themes suitable to exhibitions and sales. 
Whatever the proportion of ideologues and artists who sometimes were the same people, contributions to the doctrine, its Stalinist phase stood out as a peculiar blend of academic and realist traditions, meticulously portraying the imagined socialist dream worlds and their ideal heroes. The late 1950s, known as the Khrushchev Stow, brought partial liberalization and exoneration of modernism into Latvian thinking on art. After Stalin's death, first recognitions of the artist's individuality and subjectivity, as well as the diversity of styles and genres within socialist realism, began to appear in such all-union periodicals as Pravda, Novi Mir, Iskustva, and others. Officially sanctioned by the Soviet Communist Party's ideological secretary Dmitry Shapilov at the first All-Union Artists' Congress in 1957, such terms as a variety of socialist realism, its richness of means, handwritings and styles, were used by Latvian art critics like Herbert Dubins, Jans Pujats, painters Leo Svemps, Adoya Sabos and others. The necessity of realism was not, of course, doubted by anybody. However, it was already then no more strictly defined, shifting emphasis to such elusive uh, terms as inner essence, activity, and innovation. However, in the early 1960s, came with a new tidal wave of ideological supervision. Conservative circles in the USSR got scared by widely resurging interest in Western art. Uh, the so-called manage affair, Nikita Khrushchev's scandalous rant invoking sexual deviance against modernists at the 30 years of the Moscow Artists' Union exhibition in Moscow Manege Exhibition Hall began a campaign denouncing formalism and reverberating through all Soviet republics. Khrushchev's tirade at the 8 March 1963 meeting of party officials with representatives of literature and art, musing about filthy daubings that could be made by any donkey's tail, was published in Latvian, as was the Communist Party secretary, Leonid Ilyichos later report, criticizing formalism, abstractionism, and decadentism supported by the Soviet people's ideological enemies. The message was eagerly taken up by some local ideologues. Stage designer Arthur Slapinch was among the most active, criticizing, for example, block-like people with eyeless and noseless faces, lacking the qualities of alive and in inspiring heroes. Ideal examples of the new people already in 1961, before the Manege affair. That indicates that the scandal was actually an episode of a broader tendency. Actively looking for formalism in the works of their colleagues were also, for example, the painter Vladimir Kozins and the graphic artist Waldmas Waldmanis, who denounced lack of ideas and professionalism, leading to abandoning of realism and elements of abstractionism in the early 1960s. The so-called harsh or severe style in art that has today been already conceptualized as a version of socialist modernism, retaining ideologically charged subjects but allowing to explore color, texture, rhythm and other formal elements, was regarded, was regarded in the 1960s as a monumentally decorative trend, acceptable to some degree, but at the same time threatening to inhibit the psychological expression of images, introduce schemas and align appropriate forms lacking in their depth and freshness in the perception of life. However, in the following era ruled by Leonid Brezhnev, neither art nor art writing could be returned to the earlier neo-academic Stalinism. Accept acceptance of a broader spectrum of formal means and at least some pre-Soviet traditions of Latvian art had already taken root. The task was to subsume an ever wider selection of phenomena under the obligatory umbrella of realism. Art critics tried to maneuver between objections against the bygone naturalism and true radical modernization of form. <laughs> 
Reflections of spiritual depth and inner activity as indicators of good art allowed for a variety of formal manifestations. Particularly interested in this issue was the aforementioned critic, aforementioned critic Herbert Dubins, who continued to defend the associative imagery in the 1960s, deemed suitable for the expression of communist ideals. Theoretically more elaborated ideas about socialist realism as an open, dynamic, etc. system emerged in the USSR during the early 1970s, codified in literary scholar Dmitry Markov's publication, Theoretical Problems of Socialist Realism. And officially sanctioned by Brezhnev's speech at the Conference of European Communist Parties in 1976, where he claimed that Socialist states are not closed societies. Our doors are open to everything that is truthful and honest, and we are ready to widen contacts as far as possible, using the favorable conditions given by the reduced tensions. However, it was also emphasized that openness does not include propagandists of war and anti-Soviet agenda. In Latvian art writing of the time, most publications similarly embraced constant development, diversity, and change in socialist art, claiming that principles of socialist realism should not be seen as a restrictive code of regulations. Who were the authors voicing such ideas? Especially prolific was writer, literary critic, and historian of aesthetics, Peter Zeil, whose book, Socialist Realism, gathered numerous earlier articles from periodicals. As one of the leading promoters of the Soviet ideology, he nevertheless managed to leave that chapter behind and take up meticulous cultural and historical research of his native region of Latgal after 1991. Zeil deserves to be seen as the main figure who Latvianized the late phase of the doctrine of socialist realism, deftly compiling ideas of various Soviet authors like Dmitry Markov, Sergei Petrov, German Nedoshivin, and others, and adding examples from Latvian literature, music, theater, and also visual arts. The doctrine's diversity, openness, and dynamism were especially emphasized, for example, I quote, the principles of the socialist realist method aim at creating artworks whose artistic value results from a synthesis is diverse and able to perform multifunctional tasks. Zeil criticized the interpretation of socialist realism typical of the 1940s and 50s as one-sided, mechanical, and schematic, calling art a dynamic system that exists in transformation and development. Trying to separate his approach from structuralism, Zeil asserted that the latter was static and formal, while the dialectic system, uh, the dialectic systemic method treated its elements, quote, in mutual relations, interactions, subordination, and dynamics, end quote. In the chapter most related to the local Latvian context, he was largely positive about the realistic directness, monumentality, romanticism of youth, at the same time, social realism was said to be not content with the predominance of some particular uh, style or trend. Therefore, the 1970s, according to him, had brought uh, differentiation and branching. Uh, quote again, intellectual and analytic, associatively symbolic, metaphorically poetic, romanticist, monumentally decorative, journalistic, and other trends, and stylistic turns complement each other, intersect, and often get synthesized. So here is a panorama of the visual arts of the time. At the same time, Zeil also attempted to define the shores of socialist realism to avoid the merge of its openness with the still, de still de despicable modernism, quote, not openness towards all winds, not ideological and aesthetic diffuseness without shores, but precisely the exact outlines of the socialist worldview and socialist humanism secures the new methods, inexhaustible resources, end quote. 
Following some Soviet authors, Zayla too made reference to the once famous opus of the French communist author Roger Gardy's Realism Without Shores, whose main tenets proved too dangerous. Zayla, however, does not explain how exactly uh, these exact outlines of the socialist worldview had to be detected. Contemporary readers might find it hard to see these passages as anything but totally obscure musings. While Zayla was probably the main author speculating about the openness of socialist realism in visual arts, others deserve mention as well. One of the most prominent and prolific art critics and art historians of Soviet Latvia was Ras Malatze, um, who also used rather similar language in her exhibition, reviews, and theoretical essays. Uh, she claims that the increasingly open and diverse socialist realism still should not be confused with modernism, and their similarities are just superficial. Quote, elements reduced to absurdity are taken over from modernism, but they are purified of the modernism's reactionary structure and being an end in itself now revealed as means of expression rooted in the earliest realist system of fine arts." End quote. Nature and the ever-changing life were said to liberate the artist from slavish subservience to any canon of a narrow manner, style, or trend. Lanza continued in another article that style, uh, quote, style is not only unity, but also diversity. Several stylistic systems, which are not antagonistic, can develop on the same ideological basis. The art of socialist realism is an example of such a variety of styles or stylistic diversity." End quote. The 1970s, on the one hand, are typified by the polyphonic synthesis type painting, also deemed associative style, that has abandoned the boundaries between genres and become more abstracted, and speaking about great ideological values. On the other hand, there was an analytical trend that focused on in-depth studies of some particular phenomena. The high quality of style, according to Lotze, is secured, quote, by significant social and ideological satiation, end quote, uh, which is threatened by the passivity of thought and reluctance to give up one's favorite manner and coloring to benefit the work's content. Artists commonly did not engage much in theoretical speculations, but there were exceptions. One example was the painter Peter Spustash, uh, an adherent of largely realistic motifs laced with certain modernist influences. <clears throat> who presented a paper at the Second Soviet Latvian Culture Seminar in Turku, Finland in 1976. Uh, it was published in the newspaper Zintan's Bals, formally issued by the Committee for Return to One's Homeland, but actually supervised by the KGB and addressed to Latvians in exile. According to the memoirs of Iman Slashinsky, editor of Zintan's Bals and the double agent for the Latvian KGB and the CIA, who defected to the USA in 1978, uh, Pustash was among the most active members of the art uh, section at the Latvian Committee for, for Com Compatriots Abroad. Although many of Lashinsky's statements are now difficult to impossible to prove, this task of presenting theoretical problems of Latvian art in Finland seems to corroborate this description. Pustash clearly borrowed, paraphrased, and quoted ideas from the articles of the aforementioned Peter Zale, stating that narrow requirements in terms of either content or form would stifle socialist realism and hamper new artistic discoveries. Quote, Creative principles of socialist realism are not a code of regulations, but the most effective means of mastering and revealing the dynamics of the objective historical reality, as well as the beauty and contradictions of life. The criterion of the artwork's value is not the formal adequacy to this or that norm, but the truth of life and art embodied in it." End quote. The criterion of value was described as being socialistically true, 
mentioning the depth and originality of the ideological and aesthetic gen generalizations, and adding that a great artist never just once, uh, never just uses once acquired principles, but always complements them. However, deformation in modernism and realism was said not to be the same. To be acceptable, deformation could be even daring and striking, but it needs to be internally connected with the Marxist worldview. However, the reader of today is clearly puzzled how exactly to verify the presence or absence of this socialist truth or Marxist worldview. These and related questions pile up in attempts to interpret the legacy of such bygone ideological constructs. Russian scholar Lyudmila Budakova, in her article dedicated to the uh, 100th birthday of Dmitry Markov, uh, emphasized that his open conception did not save socialist realism, but literature itself, or more broadly, creative arts in general, allowing it to develop ever more freely, maybe even against the will of those who propagated this conception. Uh, there could be indeed this element of helping the arts to some degree. Uh, at the same time, one can notice that by the 1970s and even 80s, the idea of open socialist realism was largely promoted by authors having a high and secure status in the Soviet system and in no way willing to doubt or challenge it too far. Surely, the open conception thus is seen as the adaptation of a theory to the practice. Even trickier looks the question of whether authors themselves believed it was practically possible to distinguish between true socialist realism and seemingly similar but ideologically aligned works. Some clues can be glimpsed from the USA-based Russian anthropologist Alexei Yurchak's famous book, Everything Was Forever Until It Was No More. According to him, the literal meaning of what was said in words, speeches, reports, slogans, meetings, parades, elections, etc., did not matter much after all, quote. It became increasingly more important to participate in the reproduction of the form of these ritualized acts of authoritative discourse than to engage with their constitutive meanings, end quote. At the same time, quote again, the performative reproduction of the form of rituals and speech acts actually enabled the, uh, enabled the emergence of diverse, multiple and unpredictable meanings, end quote, that ultimately led to the system's disintegration. The progressive vagueness of the shores of socialist realism fell into ever sharper contradiction to its obligatory status, finally removed only by the perestroika years, the national awakening and the restoration of Latvia's independence in 1991. Thank you for attention. Pushing you oh, yeah, aside, okay. but I try to you, you, help with the you also should use microphone. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I think uh, it should stay here. Uh, one question is uh, people writing in the 1970s, and especially I was thinking here about Petris Zarele, how much uh, did they pick up on? earlier uh, writings, in at least in Latvian, like Andrei Supitz on socialist realism in literature in 1950s. That's one question. But was there a certain tradition of writing about socialist realism in, in Latvian uh, theory? Uh, the second broader question, I think you made a very good uh, point uh, saying that uh, somehow these theorists, they try to expand uh, expand uh, the idea of socialist uh, socialist realism, writing from uh, safe position, but trying to make it more inclusive. But there, uh, 
I was just wanted to make it sure. There was, of course, a tension between those people trying to somehow revitalize the idea of socialist realism, and on the other hand, uh, people at school or at the uni universities, I remember myself at that time, who do not understand did not understand at all what socialist realism was all about, I think. So there was certainly uh, this, despite perhaps good willingness to make it more inclusive, it was hardly, hardly possible to understand what it was. Uh, yes, uh, about Peter Zell, of course he was, uh, I think, uh, aware of uh, all those previous authors uh, who wrote about uh, these uh, socialist uh, realist ideas, but uh, I have so far focused mainly on what, what he wrote about visual arts. So yeah, it's uh, uh, it maybe it's it's worth uh, further study how to evaluate yes his uh, relationship with his past. But uh, he he was of course he was looking. For uh, for this uh, progressive democratic realist uh, trend like running uh, through Latvia's all this previous history. Uh, and uh, what, what he criticized was, was particularly this uh, Stalinist phase. It was already uh, had uh, become unacceptable when he wrote all these things. Uh, but yeah, I think it's... Uh, by, by the time of the 1970s, it, it was already clear that uh, a broader, uh, like, um, period uh, of Latvian uh, cultural history uh, can be accepted. It was no more denied like it was in these 1940s and 50s. Uh, yes, it's uh, this, this, these uh, constructs of uh, Socialist realism. I think uh, there were people who already at that time uh, like completely dismissed it it's, uh, as something meaningful. Uh, so, uh, but but those uh, who were uh, like propagating it. They were largely following uh, processes uh, in the USSR in general, mainly. Uh, in no way I would suggest that this concept of open system was, was uh, unique for Latvian authors or... Uh, no, actually not. In the case of Zell, it's also evident that he was a very uh, good compiler. He compiled uh, from various Soviet uh, writers on literature and art and etc. Uh, yeah, so, but um, what, what, what was my impression is that by this late phase of socialism, um, this uh, uh, um, concept of openness has been like co-opted by this uh, upper layer of ideologues while in, in, in uh, 19, like 1960s or 50s, if someone said something that, that uh, socialist realism is, is, is not that strict uh, term or system, it was a, a bit like of uh, like being brave and, and daring and said, saying something that was uh, re truly um, like promoting some innovation. But with time, I think it became well, yeah, like part of, of, of this ideology, this openness, uh, but yet, yeah, it, it was uh, ultimately dismantled by the, by the uh, like, uh, end of the system itself, so. Something to add to your discussions about uh, this open socialist realism. Uh, what do you think? Now I think so, but perhaps there, there was two historical accents. One, the first accent, it was Khrushchev's call. Then the idea of open socialist realism was new and it was very strong and perhaps positive. And later on, 
as uh, Benedicta said, they did not know what socialist realism was, and it was uh, uh, not a serious uh, topic at all. And then, for example, I something remember in Lithuanian literature criticism, it was again a bit ideological discussion about uh, socialist uh, realism. If it is is uh, open system, or oh, maybe it is conservative uh, uh, branch of art, socialist realism, but near him there was the other modern branches in Soviet, Lithuanian literature and art. So it was uh, in criticism such, such discussion. And of course, this opponent uh, to think that uh, there are maybe we can speak about other stylistic uh, schools and, or branches that were more dangerous. And yes, and in public, they have uh, mm, uh, couldn't to, to, to say more his, uh, his ideas. They were very dangerous. But yes, they said something. So perhaps there are two accents, historical accents, about this, uh, your problem, in your problem. Would you like to respond, Stella? Uh, yes, this, uh, this practical applicability of this uh, socialist realism is, yeah, it, it's, it's, it was really puzzling. So I, uh, I used this Yuchak's thesis in the end like to indicate that maybe it, it didn't um, actually matter what was said, what 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 kind of features this uh, socialist realism actually contains, but it, yeah, it was like a kind of of, of a re repeated ritual, uh, because if we if we look at this uh, if we look at this practical aspect. How to how to judge an artwork uh, if it fits this uh, socialistically true uh, paradigm or not? It's there is uh, nothing uh, beyond uh, someone's subjective feeling, and if if this subjective feeling is like uh, turned into uh, some normative uh, prescription, it's yeah, it's it's uh, it's very difficult to apply it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I don't see more questions at the moment, so thank you very much. And, uh, the, next, uh, uh, the next speakers uh, uh, represent the uh, wonderful Under and Douglas House Museum in, in Tallinn. And the uh, next paper is co-authored by uh, three, uh, three scholars, uh, Kri Marie Baik, Engeli Klaus, and Ele Marie Talive. And, uh, it seems that uh, Elle Marie and Hegel are going to present it. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to start by saying thank you for inviting us to talk in this wonderful building. Um, we are yet yeah, both working in the Museum of Rita Douglas, which holds the legacy of uh, Douglas his library, collections of art, photos, manuscripts. Um, so writing this uh, presentation, we discovered that there is a lot of our museum's history that uh, has yet to be explored. The presentation raises these questions for further research rather than answering them. It's been a very inspiring journey. Mm. Oh. Sorry. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, our museum celebrates its uh, anniversary this fall, almost exactly 50 years ago, um, on the 28th of September 1971. A small uh, literary museum called the uh, uh, Frida Bertuglas House Museum was founded. The museum was opened in a building where even two famous Estonian writers have once lived. The house was uh, initially built in uh, 1933 by one of the most famous Estonian poets, Maria Under, and her husband, Artur Atsun, who 
was a writer too. Mm -hmm. They lived there for 11 prolific years. Under was then at the top of her creative career. And at the end of this period, she began to write uh, topical poetry uh, related to the political situation in Estonia. Estonia had by then been occupied by the Soviet uh, Union in 1940 and by the Germans in 1941. One of her most famous poetry collections that appeared in 1942, Hal uh, with worried lips, commemorated people deported to Siberia by the Soviets in uh, 1940 and included a dedication to the Finnish Winter War. Um, in 1944, Undar escaped to Sweden with her family in fear of being deported. Um, when the Soviet occupation started again, another writer's couple moved in, Elo and Frida Vertuglas. Their house in Tartu was burned down to the ground in September 1944, um, when the Germans were retreating from Tartu. Frida Vertuglas and Elo Tuglas, who uh, initially uh, thought that the stay in the house of their friends would be temporary, ended up staying there for the rest of their lives. Elo Douglas died in 1970, Frida Bert in 1971. Um, because of Stalinist repressions, Douglas lived in this house in internal exile from uh, 1950 to uh, 1955. But uh, until the uh, mid 1950s, Douglas was uh, unable to present his work or research publicly. Since 1955, he's, uh, he was slowly acknowledged as a writer and as a classic again. After his death in 1971, the Frida Bert Douglas House Museum was founded. Um, Douglas bequeathed his collections of art, photos, uh, manuscripts and more to the Estonian Academy of Sciences, uh, since it was the only institution uh, which didn't exclude him during the Stalinist era. His only source of money for some years was a small pension paid by the Academy of uh, Sciences. So after Douglas' death, the Estonian Academy of Sciences founded Douglas' House Museum as a part of the Language and Literature Center. The museum was opened for visitors in 1976, celebrating the 90th anniversary of Douglas. The building was expanded with the addition of a small conference hall um, and a workspace for researchers. The interior was designed in quite a modern way uh, by Saima Weidenberg. The original 70s interior and atmosphere of the extension has been preserved, uh, which gives an insight into the interior design of the 70s. The materials used, uh, construction peculiarities, for example, cold, heavy cement floors, and so on. The ground floor of the building, um, built instead of the cellar, is reminiscent of shelter to be used in a nuclear war, although not a very good shelter since it has windows. In fact, in 1944, during the bombing raids, the previous owners used their cellar as a shelter. The first head of the museum department was uh, August Elma, he has written about the founding of the museum and specifically about the opening process. In an interview given on his birthday, 24th of October 1991, August Elma gave a short insight into the opening of this museum. Among other things, he recalled how this uh, house was guarded by the KGB uh, in 1971 after Douglas's death, like it was guarded daily by its predecessors in the 1950s. When Douglas, who was then uh, in the internal exile, lived there, uh, Elma allusively also mentions an edgy atmosphere surrounding this house. It's important to notice that when the museum was founded and opened, uh, only Douglas's name was mentioned in the museum's name. The couple Undar and uh, Otson, who had built the house and were as important in Estonian literary history as Douglas was, were almost completely excluded. In the short article about uh, the museum uh, in the literary magazine Kelen and Kirjandus in uh, 1976, uh, written by Elma, there isn't a single mention about Undar or Otson, or even about the house before uh, Douglas has moved in. Um, 
1944. It only says that the house had four rooms with a square footage of 115.6 square feet. Uh, there is um, a small remark um, under a photo taken of the paintings hanging in the corridor mentioning uh, illustrations from M. Munder's poetry collection Halvarius by Nikolai Trik. Maria Unders and Arthur Ratzen's names are mentioned once in the museum's introductory pamphlet from uh, 1986, saying that another writer's couple has lived in the house. Out of the 38 pictures included, there is uh, not even one of Wunder or Ratzen. Um, although Stalin's uh, death and Khrushchev thaw had allowed a modest amount of freedom, and in uh, 1958 a collection of chosen poetry had appeared in Soviet Estonia, celebrating the 75th birthday of the poet, Wunder was still practically banned in Soviet Estonia. In exile, a uh, longing for her homeland appeared in her poetry, and in the course of history, her poetry was always politicized. Unter's uh, poems in exile uh, were new breakthroughs. Uh, she embodied the community spirit of a little nation in exile, becoming a natural symbol of it. Uh, she may, remained in exile until her death in uh, 1980. August Delma's attempts to add a reference to Unter's legacy um, in this house ended without result. Estonian Cultural Fund initiated a grand scheme to capture Under and Atson's memory in 1987, but this plan never succeeded. This happened only after the restoration of Republic of Estonia. When the museum got a new name, the Under and Douglas Literature Centre of the Estonian Academy of Sciences. Mm. Uh, the museum fulfills Frida Bert Douglas' wish that both the serious scholar diving into the archives and the bright-eyed, curious novice uh, feel that they had entered the home bursting with intellectual treasures and that the owner of which had just gone out to, for a minute to take a walk under the pines of Nume and the outskirts of Tallinn. The wealth of materials that Douglas collected and that are available um, in the museum are about cultural and political changes from the beginning of the 20th century. For example, his collections illustrate the unfolding of the 1905 Russian Revolution, his first political exile after that until 1917, the founding of the nation state and its cultural policy uh, until 1940, the internal exile of Douglas in the 1950s, and also the gloomy results of uh, the first decades of Soviet occupation and the erratic literary context through the Iron Curtain. We suggest that uh, the dream of such a museum was a brave one. Uh, Douglas must have realized by the 1960s that uh, there will be um, a house museum after his death. He had become a classic again, although he was never awarded a literary award during uh, the Soviet times, except the one uh, the students from University of Tartu gave him. Still, he got some nomination from the authorities. Uh, maybe his uh, will to leave behind the collections beneath this cover uh, was an attempt to save materials for the further generations. Already after the war, but also during the inner exile, Douglas began to organize his cultural collections adding, for example, descriptions uh, to the photos and uh, comments to his materials. In an article from uh, 1976, August Elma has said that this sort of identification uh, raised the scientific value of Douglas's photo collection. We have been digitizing these materials since 2015, providing academic descriptions that are available for researchers around the world. Uh, the expected outcome is a systematic and thorough uh, digital archive of cultural collections, providing academic descriptions uh, for these, of these in digital databases that can be accessed by universities and research institutions, also scholars, publishers, uh, and other interested users, both in, in Estonia and as well as internationally. This work has told a lot about the way Douglas organized his legacy Elma in 1976 could not tell that, uh, but we can say now uh, he looked for possibilities to preserve as much as possible without harming anyone. Mm. We have discovered loops that withhold certain information 
for example, documents and objects that are missing, uh, descriptions that aren't exactly unambiguous, objects that aren't officially registered, and so on. Mm. So Elamari will provide uh, some examples of this kind of camouflage. Hello. Uh, I will give you three examples and uh, I will begin with a book. In, two, uh, in 2018, I and Grimarie Weik started to compile a book. It is a travelogue of two very close friends, Friedebert Douglas and uh, writer Karl Astrumor, who travelled in uh, 1931 through Europe. Uh, this is the book, I will send it around. Uh, we kind of uh, hope that we can leave it to a national library here, because um, on page uh, 163 you can see that uh, uh, when coming back uh, home, they stayed in Riga for one night in Hotel Petersburg. <laughs> um, when we were putting this book together, it became clear quite from the start that uh, in some certain cases, the collections carefully organized by Douglas himself uh, tend to hide some information rather than disclose it. Um, Douglas and Karl Ast, uh, a rumor were like soulmates. Both were born in 1886 and died in 1971. They are from South Estonia and in the beginning of the 20th century, already as schoolboys uh, were involved in social democratic movement and in the 1905 Russian Revolution. Both of them started writing prose, poetry and articles then. Both escaped narrowly the death penalty and spent some time in jail. Douglas lived in political exile for 11 years in Europe, I suffered three years of long prison sentence, and in 1917, they both gave a speech to Estonians in St. Petersburg, demanding political autonomy to Estonia. In 1920, Karl Aist was um, involved in the negotiations of the uh, Treaty of Tartu and became afterwards an active politician. He was a member of parliament and uh, meanwhile in the government until 1933. Uh, in 1934, um, when the era of silence began in Estonia and the parliament was dissolved, he left Estonia, living, for example, in Morocco as a businessman and then traveled in Europe and Asia as a journalist. In 1939-1940, uh, Aist uh, was a press uh, attaché at the Estonian Embassy of Stockholm. This was uh, Karl Aist who took the Treaty of Tartu, among other important documents of the Republic of Estonia, to Stockholm in March 1940. The treaty was preserved in Baltic archives and in the National Archives of Sweden until returning it to Estonia in 2002. At the request of the exiled Estonians, the National Archives of Sweden did not include the treaty in their list of holdings, an action that in a way illustrates also Douglas's own activity in organizing his archives. Uh, there are many parallels in the lives of the two friends and writers up to the 1940. Karl left Europe in 1941 forever. In the end of the 1930s, he wrote uh, repeatedly to Douglas about his fears for a future. As a journalist and a diplomat, his thoughts were sometimes rather gloomy. In 1941, while leaving Europe, boarding a ship in Finnish Lapland, he sent Douglas a letter that we have not found among their correspondence, saying farewell. Thinking of us and Douglas, um, a DNA uh, double helix comes to mind, actually. They even seem to have share a cycle of writing memoirs. Both were recorded in the beginning of the 20th century and then added memoirs uh, sporadically, often in a form of a travelogue. They changed many letters and postcards from their travels. Uh, they also dedicated some of the writings to each other. Douglas wrote the writer's biography of Karl Romorast in uh, 1936 for the uh, 
50th birthday of his friend. I answered, addressing Douglas as a brother. I published this answer again in 1961 in the Exiles Literary Periodical Mana when we both turned 75, kind of saying uh, farewell again, this time providing his birthday wishes with a remark, dear brother Douglas, we will not never uh, again, we will we'll not meet again. After the World War II, Douglas has omitted the name of Ast uh, from his writings. In his photo albums, he did not mention the names of some people, including Karl Ast, although he usually created his archives in great detail. He kept the pictures of the trip, glued them into a photo album, but left the names out. We looked for a name of Karl Ast in the text copper of Douglas, but he did not uh, give many matches. While publishing again the Memoirs of Youth, Douglas avoided um, or reduced the names of his comrades in arms gone to exile, including Karl Ast. Ast's name is only once mentioned in Douglas's selected correspondence and not at the initi initiative of Douglas himself. In his written memoirs uh, about being in Paris in 1931, published in literary magazine Loaming in 1961, Karl Ast remains nameless. Although his fragments of memory themselves can be interpreted as Douglas's congratulations to Ast on his 75th birthday, he did not mention his friends by name. There was actually no point. One of his co-travelers had been executed in Kirov Oblast in 1942. The other one lived in exile. Um, Douglas tried to leave Estonia as well. His attempt to escape in September 1944 failed. When he returned to his house in Tartu, this has burned down. And he found shelter in Maria Unders house in Tallinn. His trip to the coast was uh, very long kept uh, in silence. Here is a photograph about September 1944 in the collection of Douglas uh, from his photo album, and it's innocently titled as A Journey from Tallinn to Viljandi, which would be on the map of Estonia from north to south, depicting a party of men, women and children on a lorry in West Estonia. From the archives of Douglas, it is impossible to understand why they went uh, from Tallinn to Viljandi with a stop on the west coast, even they, if they were afraid of uh, the approaching war. Still, Douglas did not destroy the photos that were actually dangerous to keep. More than that, he included pictures with references to west coast. Douglas was traveling with uh, Hermann Evert, who took the photos. While comparing uh, Evert's photographs from different archives, it became clear that this lorry was sent to transport the last government uh, of Estonia and the most important Estonian cultural figures to the western coast. The boat was late, only the state secretary Helmut Mandi managed to find a way to leave. But the story of an attempt to go to Sweden was kept secret here and never came public. Although, it, in a way, it is fully presented in the collections of Douglas, quite similar to the story of keeping the peace treaty in Stockholm, and the evidence that Douglas tried to took the advice Karl Eistromor had given to him. Uh, here is another photograph from this journey, uh, and here is a comparison from different archives. And the last example. Elo Douglas had a painting of, of her sister Selma Kurvitz hanging in her living room. Selma and Peter Kurvitz were deported to Siberia in 1941, and Selma perished there. The painting was given to Selma's daughter after the death of Douglas. Uh, but all through the Soviet years, and on the photographs reflecting the house of a writer during his lifetime kept in the museum, Selma's portrait silently hints to those who had deported, shot, or had to, to go to exile. Uh, to conclude, mm. Let's go back to a slide of the lorry. Although there are some periods, for example, 1940 uh, up to 1941, he could not retain, 
probably because of thinking about his and our safety. Douglas tried to preserve his legacy, tending here and there to hide some information rather than disclose it, leaving yet the possibility to create the web of meaning again. The things are starting to emerge now from the silence of the archives, and this is in the hands of today's researchers and museum workers to make the archives speak. While describing the objects in the databases, it has become clearer and clearer but it is important to create connections between objects, make them searchable together as parts of a network meaning something. This is what we did while compiling uh, this 1931 travelogue. Um, the Museum of Tuglas was founded as um, a kind of uh, inevitability. The way he organized his collections, it reflects responsibility for the preservation of his, his heritage and legacy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Uh, well, uh, I was thinking about um, about contexts of, of creation of, of this museum, and um, obviously, uh, Douglas was not a Soviet writer, even if he spent half a half a century during the Soviet rule. And uh, from what you said, it should be more or less clear that uh, it, he was also memorized as a great, uh, one of the great men of, uh, of Estonian letters. But there, let's say in 1970s, also references to him as a person involved in some way in, in Soviet realities or, or not at all, what would you say? Um, I would like to think that um... He realized at some moment that there will be a kind of museum and everything uh, for him. Uh, for example, they couldn't also avoid of having a fish trawler named by <laughs> Estonian literary classics. Um, but uh, he kind of tried to defend his legacy from uh, um, being uh, in an, such kind of ex exhibit or museum that would be really Soviet. Uh, he distributed his heritage a bit. He sent some things to the Estonian Literary Museum and um, uh, there was um, some kind of condition that I think that could not be researched um, for about 10 years or something. He was kind of... Um, thinking that these people he mentions will be dead by then. Um, but um, I think even in the 19, end of the 1960s, he very clearly understood that he's not really um, uh, a good Soviet writer or taking into his tradition. Um, he was for quite a long time sure for example, that his um, the short story award uh, he wanted to uh, found uh, will be really there. Uh, in, in, in one point, I would like to think that it was a kind of miracle that this museum uh, was founded at all, but when there is this thing I always keep in mind that uh, it's a kind of thing that would have been there, but in a different way, for a kind of house museum telling the story of uh, a young uh, writer to develop into a Soviet writer or something, but what he did not do, really. Yeah, thank you very much. I think it's really broad the issue of these of these memorial memorial museums, and in Latvia, I would uh, think, and Lithuania as well, most of them were really uh, treasures of, of of cultural cultural memory. But if we you 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 would think about an alternative example, like people turn into Soviet icons, like for us probably Vilis Latsis, or to an extent Andrei Supis would be examples. Are there similar cases also in Estonia with these? people, Soviet writers, uh, we, who had uh, memorial museums at that time. 
I am afraid that uh, Edward Wilde is one good example. He was long dead before <laughs> the Soviet occupation began, but during the Soviet period, he was kind of made into a Soviet writer. And this is up to now the reason why actually people do not like to read uh, Wilde. <laughs> and I have uh, even heard that museum workers were sometimes tell that uh, he belongs to the last century or something like that. <laughs> very, very interesting. We, we have to, to, to talk about that. Uh, any other questions? Uh, if not, then thank you very much for, for, your, uh, for your interesting paper. And uh, we have one, uh, one last uh, speaker in this, in this session. Uh, we started long ago in 1996 this, um, this conference as mostly um, event involving three institutions in, in Tallinn, Vilnius and Latvia, but uh, people from, from other universities and uh, have come in. And uh, uh, Dennis Hanos, whom I have the pleasure to introduce here, presents Riga Stradinch University. Please, the floor is yours. so to say, colonial gaze of one of the most famous Soviet and Russian dissident authors, Sergei Davlatov, whose uh, anniversary was recently celebrated in September in St. Petersburg. And each year there is a kind of Davlatov festival with readings of his texts and conferences and debates, and final also the ritual of drinking, because uh, his uh, uh, native street, Rubenstein Street, is the street uh, of bars and coffee houses uh, in St. Petersburg and is also a traditional place of uh, cheap alcohol, which will play uh, an important role in his uh, short novels, Compromise, which were actually published after he was uh, sent away to the States by the Soviet powers in 1979, together with his mother. But before I proceed, I would like to ask the question, is there anyone in the room for whom the Russian language would be a uh, kind of challenge to understand? Uh, right, so I will try then to make kind of summary in English and will read out some short fragments also in Russian because uh, it's really uh, all in the language. So I hope I will cope with the, okay, yes. So um, I think there is a general consensus on the uh, Baltic, uh, so to say, way of uh, colonial culture presented by the Soviets since the 1940 and of course after the war, 1944 till 1991, uh, the Soviet colonial power, which was analyzed also by distinguished uh, Miss Kellertus and Eb Annus and many others, is the so it's a version of the colonial power and culture, but it is continental. It has no exotic overseas colonies, uh, but at the same time, it still preserves the uh, idea of, uh, so to say, uh, white man's burden, but it's a Soviet man's burden to uh, change the societies in the Baltics. Um, so to say, ignoring the 20 years of democracy and also authoritarian regime, the Western culture. So the Baltics should have uh, been uh, a new Soviet version of the success story of the Bolsheviks. And in the lot of uh, 12 uh, short stories, Compromise, which this describe his uh, working as a journalist in the Soviet Estonia newspaper from uh, 1972 to 1975. It's the description of the Soviet power colonizing Russians 
in Estonia and of course the what was called then uh, the ethnic minorities the um, so say majority of the Estonian population the Estonians and also um, in uh, marginal form the Latvians which are mentioned in his 12 stories and I think we all can agree that the Soviet uh, colonial power uh, is a mixture of uh, Russian Tsarist period, starting from the Alexander III, uh, so-called Russification, which was also uh, an important part of the Latvian national movement development, which faced the new paradigm after the uh, death of Alexander II, and it also was combined in the 30s with the Bolsheviks regime in Stalin's version, abandoning the modernism culture, or rather using it as an ideological tool to create the social realism in different uh, arts, in literature, in drama, and other spheres of public life. So, uh, and I think still, unfortunately, we are faced with the formula of Ruski Mir, the Russian universe, so to say, which is a kind of new type of digital um, colonial power by Putin. Uh, so, um, the colonization means also transforming not only territories, not only using some resources, which is a scarce question in the Baltic case, but it also colonizing minds, emotions, and everyday life. And this is what Tavlatov was describing in his Compromise 12 stories, uh, which actually sort of started to appear during the Estonian period, then also partly completed after his uh, coming back to um, the uh, Leningrad. So, um, and it's interesting that in these 12 stories, uh, which describe the everyday life of uh, Russian journalists in Soviet Estonia, uh, it is actually the combination of imperial, Soviet, and national issues. Uh, so I think it is uh, very important to, um, to include these stories in the discourse of how uh, Russian Soviet literature of this period, the dissident literature, uh, reflected on the situation of Baltic nations. Uh, so this short information would be uh, necessary for those who would come, so to say, uh, from without the Baltic space, so I will uh, just skip it. But I think it is important to understand that Davlatov is also partly colonized, so he is a Russian partly Jewish dissident who is experiencing in this period the way uh, how the Soviet power uh, transforms the biography of the uh, um, author who writes, um, so say, critical texts about the Soviet everyday political uh, space or universe. These 12 short stories describe the situation in Tallinn, and Tallinn is also a colonized space, which uh, is uh, the um, so say the space of uh, different, the different ethnic, political, and everyday culture. So one of his best friends, Valery Popov, who has uh, also written recently his biography, um, opens the chapter on compromise by describing Tallinn as the Soviet Western a city. It was also uh, related to Riga and um, Vilnius in different ways, also in the everyday life. For example, my mother coming from the Western Ukraine here to uh, Latvia and Riga of the early 70s, so the period of Dovlatov's text, also uh, perceived this room as kind of Western culture. So the Popov says that each time someone from Leningrad visited Tallinn, it was a trip to the Soviet West, the only one possible and uh, accessible. Um, и у всех нас возникала радостная догадка, а может там и настоящей советской власти нет? Ведь не может же быть при советской власти так хорошо. So the question was, it was probably a riddle. What if there is no Soviet power in Tallinn? Because you can't live in such good conditions under Soviet power. Uh, so um, at the same time, Davlatov is also following this paradigm of uh, colonial guest, I would say, the one who is for the short time in Tallinn, who scrutinizes the whole situation from without.
and at the same time, of course, Davlatov is not the copy-paste of his literary hero. There is a distance, there are some slight changes in the biography, uh, but what is interesting is that he discovers the other at the same time being the other of the Soviet power. So it's a kind of double um, colonization scenario. He is opposed to the Soviet absurdity in the uh, Soviet Russian speaking newspaper with the editor in chief called Turonok. It's his surname, and he's described as the man made of uh, marzipan, so the one who is very flexible. So he's sweet and ugly at the same time. I don't mean physically, but it's too much uh, sugar. Uh, so, um, and he encounters in uh, some of these stories, there are 12, so I will probably use only two of them, number five and number eight. Uh, so he discovers the exotic other. But this is also very interesting. The exotic other is not the one who is in the hierarchy at the lower stage. So it's not the classical uh, British or um, Dutch or French colonial power with the idea of nations who should be uh, sustained and developed. Of course, there is still the paradigm of industrialization and so on and so forth. And even now in the public politics, sometimes you can hear on, let's say, everyday basis on the central market here that, well, the Soviets came and they created the industry, factories, and now the national movement and the restored states have destroyed all of these where jobless and so on and so forth. So this idea is still vital in everyday politics. But the lot of uh, objects of the other are probably even more developed, so to say, and they are um, the representatives of the former West, which is uh, forgotten and forbidden. For example, the Estonian doctor, uh, who is uh, very carefully dressed, who is the Estonian uh, whom uh, the author can uh, actually uh, recognize at once. So uh, he says, for example, that um, he can um, recognize the Estonians at once without mistakes. Estonians я отличаю сразу же и безошибочно. Ничего крикливого, размашистого, неизменный галстук и складка на брюках, бедноватая линия подбородка и спокойное выражение лица. Да и какой русский будет делать гимнастику в одиночестве? So, uh, it's actually the story when the author, the literary hero, is supposed to find a good example of Soviet, Russian and Estonian friendship of the nations. It's his task, he's tired of it, he's actually almost over in hangover situation. He wants badly a drink but he needs to write an article very quickly. So he goes to the uh, house where babies are born and he is looking for the, uh, so to say, colonized baby. And the Soviets in these novels colonize not only Russians, the dissidents, they colonize also the Estonians by, uh, so to say, superpower of colonized power. They can change the alphabetic order so when he writes an article about the conference, he just recollects the countries which participate, and he starts with A, B, C, and so on. And the editor says that it's not the political way how you create the list, because there are good countries, the Soviet and socialist countries, then there are neutral countries, and then there are NATO countries. So you need to change the alphabetic order. And the colonizing the uh, literary space means also colonizing the alphabet. And in some cases, uh, you can also colonize the child. So uh, the editor looks for a correct um, child to symbolize the friendship of Estonians and Russians. And there are three attempts, just like in a fairy tale. The first one is uh, from Ethiopia, and he is not uh, eligible because the Ethiopian student, even if he is Marxist, he just uh, is not the correct person. And uh, we see here the fake of the international friendship with African uh, countries. Um, and um, one example. Его отец дружественный нам эфиоп, 
Вы хотите сказать черный? Ну, шоколадный. То есть негр? Естественно. Что ж тут естественного? А по-вашему, эфиоп не человек? Давлатов, я вас уволю за попытки дискредитировать все самое лучшее. Дождитесь нормального, нормального человеческого ребенка. So just wait for a normal human baby to be born and then choose him as an object of an article. Uh, the second attempt was the other unfortunate baby of a Jewish person, and this attempt also failed. Stein, еврей. А каждого еврея нужно согласовывать. Ты фантастически наивен, Серж. So each Jew should be, so to say, recognized by the Soviet power. And then finally, there is a good and right uh, baby. So this is the baby which comes from the Estonian and Russian uh, family, and this baby will be chosen to be colonized by choosing his uh, name. So um, the name should be Lembit, which comes from folklore, it's a traditional name, and the editor of the newspaper decides that the name of this correct baby will be Lembit and not Vladimir. So, а это же очень старомодно. Какая им разница? Лембит хорошо, мужественно и символично звучит. В юбилейном номере это будет смотреться. So for the jubilee edition it will be good to underline this Estonian Russian uh, friendship. А, откажутся назвать Лембитом, посулите им денег. Сколько? Рублей 25. Фотографа я пришлю. Как фамилия новорожденного? Кузин. Лембит Кузин прекрасно звучит. Действуйте. So, Лембит uh, Кузин is a great uh, combination. So, go on, uh, write an article. Um, so, uh, this is one of the examples how Davlatov's hero is scrutinizing the Soviet policy, and he is detached. There is a distance. He does not really agree with the politics of colonizing the um, Estonians and Latvians. He is aware of the occupation. He also uses this term. One of his heroes, the drunkard photographer Zhbankov, says, well, I stayed here after the war, so I'm an occupant. And uh, these uh, dissidents know the story of the SS Legion. They also know the story before the occupation, and they use it not to show compassion to the local nations, but to oppose the Soviet power. So they are actually quite indifferent to the tragedies of the uh, Baltic nations. They look at them as something exotic, and at the same time, this exoticism is kind of predominant. So the Russians in this case, um, are, if we use the idea of hierarchy in the lower stage. So uh, a young Estonian journalist, Evi, a young woman, whom the hero meets. She is, uh, so to say, the future uh, of the uh, Estonian uh, youngsters. She is aware of sex, which was, of course, non-existent in the Soviet period. Uh, she uh, knows what sex is good and what is not. She is also motivated to find a good fiancé who is not drunkard. And uh, there are also some strategies of how the Dovlatov's hero is opposed to the colonial strategies of the Soviet uh, government. Uh, he uh, denies the whole ideology, and he denies it being constantly drunk. So it is vodka, which is, so to say, one of the escape rooms of the dissident in this period. And uh, together with his colleagues, he is uh, drinking all the time. Uh, and uh, drinking means not to think. Uh, not to think means uh, to escape uh, the uh, totality of the Soviet regime. So the dialogue between both of them. Знаешь, что я тебе скажу? Не думай. И все. Я уже лет 15, не думаю. А будешь думать, жить не захочется. Все, кто думает, все несчастные. А ты счастливый? Я-то? Да я хоть сейчас в петлю. Что же делать? Не думать. Вот купить. Жбанков достал бутылку. Я, кажется, напьюсь. А то нет. Хочешь из горла? 
там же есть стакан, кайф не тот. Uh, so we come to this universal way of escaping, drinking, drinking and drinking, and also undermining the um, predominant exoticism of the other. So Evie is trying to have sex with him because he is kind of perspective fiancé for her because she's dreaming of the car and also of uh, living in Tallinn. Uh, but he is drinking especially quickly to, so to say, uh, pass, uh, pass away. Uh, and Okay, Stary Dennis. I was just thinking uh, about if you would like to put it into into some kind of context, what uh, what uh, your choices would be. And I was uh, I was thinking about two possibilities. One is um, some kind of classical classical uh, post-colonial studies. Uh, describing people who feel themselves also in between, like being or presenting, representing colonizers, but, but still having a feeling to, to native people, especially maybe I'm thinking of Albert Memmi's classical study of juxtaposing colonizer and colonized and being in between. But, but there is also a sort of writing back from the, uh, from the, the Baltic, uh, Baltic literatures. And uh, Estonian colleagues will correct me. I think it was Maimas, uh, Maimu Berga's book uh, Berg's book, uh, I Loved Russian, uh, at, at about the same time, kind of providing a, a different perspective on, on the relations you are more or less describing. But what would you su your suggestions be if you would like to put this into some, some kind of context? Uh, well, the context is uh, also kind of political tool. But I think uh, in uh, many cases what uh, Latvian academic discourse is trying to do now is to collect the oral uh, histories of the Soviet period. I think the uh, institutes which are the institutes of the Latvian University which are gathering also the uh, stories of the other, meaning the uh, ethnic minorities, Russian-speaking people who came to Latvia after the war, and they also get their voice now. Uh, so they are not, so to say, uh, eliminated. And if we remember the Said's ideas of imperial culture, that is also very important to read the uh, life stories uh, which can hide the stories which are kept silent by the dominant literary discourse. So one of my um, topical issues now at the moment is how the post-colonial Baltic cultures political cultures create the discourse of ethnic minorities at the moment. So we are actually uh, here and we of course see the uh, monument for Soviet soldiers, which was for many uh, years uh, defined as liberators. And then after the change of the political culture, they for many people represent the uh, tragic story of the occupation. So this is what interests me uh, a lot. So how much of the Brezhnevism uh, ethnopolitics is still there in the Baltics, in the political elites. I think this is one of the challenges of the social cohesion of our country. So we should not, um, uh, so to say, support the uh, idea of uh, post-colonial gaze uh, 
uh, of the minorities which do not participate in the political agenda of the countries. Because if we share the democracy which we gained after the uh, breakdown of the Soviet Union, we should also find place for alternative stories which are probably uh, alternatives also for many of us in emotional way, but these are the stories which have been lived and experienced. So I think this is uh, what we really need to pursue to find this space for the other uh, to be part of the uh, Estonian, Lithuanian and Latvian political cultures. Otherwise, we will have uh, the continuation of this exoticism uh, and uh, kind of post-colonial syndrome. Yeah. Thank you. Perhaps I try to provoke someone. I'm looking at Digna, I'm looking at Rita, I'm looking at Violetta, perhaps some of you or any uh, other in this room would like to ask a question. Well, anyway, I would comment. suggest... Uh, I, see, this novels, this I see Rita's comment and then, uh, then Ausha, was, it was also you, okay. Hi, uh, you mentioned this escape strategy uh, through consuming vodka, yeah? Uh, do, uh, do other strategies appear in his uh, stories, novels? Like, uh, I, I know that uh, there were groups of like, who were driven towards oriental, spiritual teachings, yoga and such, so maybe there's some other escape rooms. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, well, as far as I know, these 12 novels uh, all uh, are somehow concentrated on the consuming uh, alcohol. It's even the escape of uh, what already has been mentioned uh, in the book of Yurchak, the late period of the Soviet Empire, uh, where people actually were tied to work and they always had in some shops like Piri Uchot, so the, the break for many hours to do actually nothing or just drinking. Because drinking in Dovlatovs, that is even the expression at the moment in uh, Petersburg culture, um, Dovlatovshina, this is how you drink heavily with philosophy touch. So, uh, because as I mentioned, the, Rubin, the Rubinstein Street uh, represents the mixture of elite bars and restaurants and very, very cheap um, alcohol consuming places, which are called the Rumachnaya. And a lot of texts are linked to this tradition because uh, alcohol is always uh, the way how you actually mix, uh, well, in fact, there is no freedom with alcohol. It's just the imagination of being free. Uh, because in many of these 12 novels, uh, the hero says, the borders of the reality are shrinking. So I can't really, and I don't want to see anymore the reality. So it's, it's, not, it's unbearable. And sometimes it leads to some, uh, so to say, um, um, unplanned sex, uh, but then with some very heavy headache and uh, hangover, uh, his uh, friend even says that he would create kind of testimony to his uh, uh, next generation, never uh, make love in hangover. So it's very, t it's, it's terrible uh, physical reaction. This is one thing. The other thing is to actually uh, quickly uh, finish your article and then just go walking or meeting friends because the Brezhnev period has created the kitchen opposition, the kitchen dissidents. So most of his colleagues here are not brave. It's interesting that brave people are actually the Baltics, so the Estonians and Latvians. There is the comic figure of gigolo journalist Bush who is Latvian, of good Latvian family, but he has rejected the, so to say, uh, Soviet middle-class culture. He escaped to Estonia, to Tallinn, and is using his, um, so to say, uh, education uh, to create some kind of um, you know, identity of charmeur. So he's uh, trying to uh, conquer elderly ladies with uh, quoting Akhmatova and so on and so forth. And he, he actually lives with them and they pay for his living. So uh, he's also almost uh, all the time drunk and even fell asleep uh, when he was questioned by the KGB officer. <laughs> uh, and it's really, it's hilarious novel, which is very tragic because there is actually no escape. Uh, not thinking is sometimes a physical reaction, you just drink and then you disappear, or you just try to actually use the Gogol language, because there is a lot of Gogol subjects and plots in the lot of uh, texts. Uh, it's lying, it's the, um, the lying facade of the Soviet culture with all the... Um, 
uh, positive results and five years plan and so on and so forth. Uh, the um, compromise number eight uh, tells the story of a peasant whose cow had the most, uh, the large number of uh, milk, I don't know how it's called in English, and so she was actually planned to be filmed and photographed. She was photographed, but uh, the cow did not actually uh, fit the camera, so the journalist said, well, I have many cows in the archive, I will just make kind of, you know, uh, combination. And this lady is a kind of puppet, so she does not speak any Russian at all, and she all, she just told the story uh, and it's really it's 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 great uh, the Gogol language comes in the story where Brezhnev decided to stage the direct contact with the uh, 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 Soviet folk uh, in Estonia just like Putin at the moment uh, addressing people which are well planned and selected so and uh, the lot of was to write the telegram to Brezhnev from this lady peasant saying about her results and um, and so on and that she's a party member and uh, it's interesting that uh, instead of writing he was drinking all the time in Estonia and when he came next day with hangover the Brezhnev has already sent the answer but there was no any letter and then actually they were wondering that the Brezhnev secretary is uh, most effective uh, so to say sending the answer before there was any question at all so it's the absurdity of how uh, the so to say staged communication with the working class and peasants uh, is, is being created. So it's the absurdity and also some kind of uh, bravery because as I mentioned, these are Estonians who are talking about the um, uh, the poets and writers who are forbidden, they are talking about Israel, which is also kind of forbidden country, uh, and they are talking also about the sexual education and so on and so forth. And the uh, uh, Latvian Gigolo journalist uh, was uh, also arrested uh, because uh, he had the poster for the October uh, demonstration, uh, keep your hands off uh, the um, the capitalist system. So, and the KGB did not read it because they were accustomed to the correct language. And only after this, they have actually understood that this is the poster against the Soviets. And then he was arrested. You know, and uh, it's. Um, uh, another strategy of colonizing because uh, you colonize space, you colonize thoughts, you colonize everyday life and the only small space is the kitchen and then it is you and it's not you at the same time because you are almost always drunk. So, thanks. Uh, thank you very much and the suggestion is that we continue during, I think we continue during lunch break, uh, it was suggestion by, by Austria and afterwards, but uh, Rita is here and in 40 minutes we have also an excursion into uh, archives of Latin folklore as far as I could. Yeah, thank you and thank you for all speakers being so disciplined. <laughs>